Uh, so maybe that's a good thing. Maybe there's no good expectation of anyone on how this is going to go because I honestly am, am kind of winging this. I've, I've got an idea of how it's going to go, um, but I've only been working on it for a couple of weeks. I don't have 13 lessons planned out and, and, and a whole quarter firmly in place. Uh, <clears throat> so it may change a little bit. It may stay exactly how I have it in my head at the moment. Um, we'll just have to see. So thank you for joining me on this experiment. <laughs> so <clears throat> the idea is, yes, we are going to talk about uh, the songs that we sing. You know, we've got a book full of them, and we sing some that aren't in the book. <clears throat> some of them we've been singing for years. Some of them are newer songs. <clears throat> so way more songs than we can talk about. So the, my picture for this is for a while we will spend part of each lesson talking about songs and singing a little bit, some verses from the Bible. Uh, but in each lesson, I want to look at at least one song individually and maybe what the scriptural references to those are. Uh, many of them have very strong tie-ins to scripture. Uh, quote, they quote lines from, from, from various verses. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to look at, at both sides of that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Actually, I had a cold a couple of weeks ago, so my, if my voice doesn't hold out, I apologize. So trivia question. First mention of music in the Bible. Does anybody know what that was? It's a bit obscure, actually. Okay, so here, here are the first two that I found. In Genesis 4, uh, in describing the lineage of Cain, uh, for, verse 21, his brother's name was Jabal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. So this is an area where uh, Genesis was, you know, was writing, you know, w one son was the father of those who kept livestock. Uh, another was, you know, those who, I think, tilled the field or something. Uh, but this particular person, father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Uh, so maybe they invented them, maybe they made them, and, th and then they were skilled at using them. Uh, I really wish we had a good idea of, I should have put that up earlier, apologies. Uh, I, w I, um, I wish we had a good idea of what the music was actually like back then. Uh, we, we have some indication, I mean, we've got our idea of Western music, and I may talk about, you know, some of this in another lesson, uh, but before the, the Western music thing that we have in our ear of, you know, 12 half steps and a scale and how harmony works and we sing four-part harmony, we know that there was, you know, uh, some things were chanted, uh, you know, going back thousands of years, we just don't know, uh, but there were apparently... Uh, in musical instruments at that point. So, you know, those, he was the father of those who play the lyre and the pipe. So there was music uh, just several generations from Adam and from, of course, his son Cain. If you go a little bit later in Genesis, <coughs> when Jacob is leaving the household of, of Laban with his wives, you know, Laban chases after him and says, Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with joy and with songs, with timbrel and with lyre? So you can see at this point, music was a part of life. You know, it was something that people used to celebrate. Uh, I tend to think that by, by this point, it's just like music is for us. You know, it, it expresses mood and emotion and thought, um, but it was definitely, a, you know, an integral part of, uh, of life at that point. It's not till you get to Exodus that you actually have a song that is in the Bible uh, in, in terms of what, what we would call the lyrics, the, the words. And that's in Exodus 15, uh, the first 18 verses. Uh, it is sometimes called a song of Moses. And it was to, to the Lord, 
after Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. Just the, the first few verses of it uh, are as follows. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And it goes on. It's interesting that um, the, the writers, even from you know centuries ago when... Uh, when the English Bible first started to be mass, mass produced, you'll see, you know, that the King James uh, would write some passages in verse and some as prose, uh, and we continue to, to see this now. Uh, and, and again, for, for maybe some uh, question a little beyond what uh, what I've been able to track down, the translators would have, you know, picked up on cues from the text as to this. This is a poem or this is a, a song. Some things are literally say uh, they are a song and they are written that way. We will come back or, or revisit this, uh, the Song of Moses <clears throat> a little bit later. And, and it may actually uh, warrant it, its own lesson in our series. Uh, there is a, a, another passage in Deuteronomy, I believe it was, that is also sometimes called Song of Moses. Um, so if you see a reference to the Song of Moses, not sure exactly which one it refers to, but, uh, but we will touch on that later. <clears throat> so there were other songs and singers in the Bible. Uh, if we just stick to the Old Testament, can you name some things that come to mind? David played the harp, yes. Miriam had a song. Yes, that's good. That's a, a little less common. Tied into David playing the harp, what did he do when he played the harp? Say again. He played for the king. He played for the king. He played for Saul. Remember, at that point, you know, Saul had some issues and he would be calmed when David would play for him. Uh, so there you go back to some of the, you know, what music does to us as, as humans. Uh, so you get uh, an indication of how music can be a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, when the uh, Israelites took on Jericho, they played um, the king the blue horn. Yes. I didn't even think of that one. So when the Israelites uh, circled Jericho, they blew on the trumpet. They, you know, there, there are many places where you hear of uh, especially trumpets being blown. Um, maybe a little less musical, but certainly the, the instruments themselves were there. Uh, in that case, it was more of a, uh, uh, a, a call to, uh, to fight. Uh, it, was a, an, you know, it went along with the act of war. Um, on that same vein, I don't have here on, on my outline, I don't think, uh, but you also hear or read, rather, of angels with trumpets, you know, with it now <clears throat> announcing things. Other songs from the Old Testament. I heard somebody say something, but Song of Solomon. Well, that's good, exactly. Uh, that one even calls the, the, the entire book, says it's, it's a song. How about Deborah and Barak after a victory? So they used a, a song to celebrate. In Samuel. We read about the people, and it says, it says the women. I'm not sure why, and, unless it was because the men were actually at war. But, you know, to celebrate the victory, it says the, the women went out, and, and uh, I, I didn't put the passage down. But they were celebrating with music and dancing, I think, and, and the timbrels. Uh, so, so there was music involved in celebrating the victory. And then, I, as I had mentioned, you know, people... Uh, David played for Saul. 
Uh, and then you can go back to when David has his, had his victories, the people celebrated again, and that caused problems with Saul uh, because the song that they sang uh, about, you know, uh, I believe it was Saul had his thousands, David his ten thousands. Uh, so the lyrics of, of the song that they celebrated with uh, actually caused problems with Samuel. So you can see over and over there was uh, singing and songs involved in their everyday life. Uh, an interesting and uh, change took place after the temple was built. So for the first time we see a reference to God telling the people to have music in the temple. <clears throat> Interestingly, I mean, it's, uh, it's Old Testament temple worship, uh, so he actually asks for uh, the, the harps and the lyres. It says, uh, he then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps and with lyres, according to the command of David and of Gad, this king seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For the command was from the Lord through the prophets. So here we've gone from up until now, all of the, the music that has been mentioned seems to have been, you know, spontaneous or, um, you know, from the, from the worshippers. Uh, direction or the the celebrator's direction, uh, if it's worship, you know, towards God. Uh, but here, in in uh, describing what he wanted in the temple, uh, God said he wanted music. Uh, so, uh, and and that also the the singers are mentioned many times in Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. After that, uh, there's. Over and over, I didn't even count them. Uh, there are references to the singers and the musicians uh, that would serve in the temple for, for that temple worship. <clears throat> then you get to Psalms. And that's a whole book of songs. You know, over and over. And, that, and that's another one of those where you know, it's been recognized uh, for centuries that, that those were songs and uh, many of them were uh, written by David. I, you know, I got a big blank slide there. Once again, that's something that deserves its own lesson. Uh, so I didn't bother really digging into that. We'll come back to it later. Um, but over and over, the entire pass or the entire book is song after song. And once again, it, it's written in, in more of a script uh, for us. Uh, Script, probably not the best word, um, but rather than as prose, it's written as poetry, uh, what we would think of as poetry or lyrics to a song. And, and like I said, we will definitely come back to that. Okay, so I'm doing really, really good on time. I actually was uh, planning this for having a little less time than I saw the bulletin said we're running till 1015, so we may finish early. Okay. <clears throat> Singing in the New Testament. Can you think of times when song was mentioned in the New Testament? Say again. The Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus and disciples were waiting for Jesus. You know, the Romans or the Jews come to arrest them. Yes, in, in the Garden. Um, I think you mean from, and I've got this from Matthew 26, it says, after singing, they had just had the Lord's Supper. After singing to him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That passage, yeah. Uh, so they, ha they sang hymns, and at, at this point, now we've got a new word. We've got the word hymn. Uh, and once again, we may, we may define some of these words in a separate, uh, in a separate class, but I'm, I'm trying to do an overview of, of songs this morning. Uh, so after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Given the time of year that we are currently in, can you think of a, uh, an event where people normally associate it with singing? Mary sang, yes. After Mary went to see Elizabeth, you know, there is a song that is related uh, there, usually uh, frequently called the Magnificat. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, again, that may be something we dig in, into later. Um, 
on that same subject, you know, this is the time of the year that people associate with the birth of Christ. Is there anything you can think of where people think of singing? Yes, the angels came to the shepherds. Now, this one is an interesting one. Um, I actually, in some of the reading I did, I came across uh, someone who wrote that they don't think the angels sing, that they think that singing or that music is a uniquely human thing, that the angels were there and they were announcing, they were shouting, um, but they were not singing. I kind of tend to lean the other way, but it was an interesting read. Um, but I think it's four or five, chapter four or five, that shows that um, the heavenly beings singing and singing a new song. I'll try to find it. Yes, but, um, we're going to go there actually. So, yeah, we're going there, and that's why I lean towards disagreeing with the person who says no, they weren't singing. Uh, so I, I tend to think that yeah at as the, as the angels and the, I think it says the heavenly hosts were appearing to the shepherds and it says that they were shouting hallow, you know, glory uh, to God in the highest or whatever the, the passage was. Uh, I tend to think, yeah, they were singing uh, because of that. Heavenly beings are described in Revelation and we'll get to it later. Uh, but, it, it, you know, that's something, uh, you know, all you have to do is watch the uh, Charlie Brown Christmas special and you, you know, you, you get this picture of, of voices singing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, after singing a, a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives that we mentioned earlier. Tracy? Wow, you would think that was prompted. Honestly, it was not. My next bullet point from Acts 16. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Uh, and the prisoners were listening to them. Uh, that really wasn't planned. That was just... <laughs> I, I, I guess you uh, uh, married so long you start reading each other's mind or something. Um, Notice that in these things, in these verses, no, there's not. Yeah. Uh, so so the, if you didn't hear, the, the comment was, everybody here is singing. They're not playing the timbrel or the harp or the lyre, but, but it is very much a vocal thing. <clears throat> As we go on, Then there is this passage from Colossians where, you know, Paul is writing and a, and a very similar passage in Ephesians where he tells them to teach and admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, and again, we, we may come back to, to that. Uh, I know we'll come back to that later uh, and, and look at uh, the phrase uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, so now not only do we have worship towards God, <coughs> excuse me, worship towards God, but the singing and the t is, is providing the function of teaching to each other. Uh, we're told in Hebrews to encourage one another. Uh, so I'm sure it, it doesn't specifically say in, in that one uh, with singing. Uh, but, you know, if we are teaching and admonishing one another, you know, that encouragement would go along. Then if you continue, Revelation 4, 5, some other areas in, uh, in, in the book of Revelation. Now this is you know, somewhat uh, um, difficult to interpret sometimes, um, but you know, in spite of a lot of the imagery in the book of Revelation, some of the things are just, to, to me, very obvious. So here you have a picture of heaven. And, you know, there's description of these heavenly beings with um, four faces and wings and feet, and uh, they move in different directions. So it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to paint that picture. Uh, 
Uh, but these heavenly beings and the elders that are there, you know, they are, they sang a new song. Uh, there's, there's references, by the way, to new song. I believe it was in, in Isaiah. Uh, so we're going to come back in another lesson and talk about uh, singing a new song. Go ahead, Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13, 15, where it talks about our sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. Oh, thank you. I missed that one. The sacrifice of, of our praise and the fruit of our lips from Hebrews 13. Uh, I'm going to have to make a note of that one. Uh, later in Revelation, Revelation 15, uh, and this is where I said we would come back to the Song of Moses. So here again is another... Uh, passage talking about singing it says and they sang the song of Moses the bondservant of God and the song of the lamb so if, if you follow that there, there's actually this is another one of those places where there are lyrics uh, and if you follow that it's, it is somewhat similar in theme the, it's, it's definitely not a quote from uh, from Exodus 15 uh, it's not a quote from the Deuteronomy passage that I mentioned earlier is uh, frequently called a, a song of Moses. But some of the themes, uh, and I, I didn't put it here again because I think we need to come back to it, uh, but some of the themes in this uh, passage from Revelation 15 is similar to the Exodus 15 uh, song of Moses. Uh, it is a very much a praise uh, and to the power uh, of and the presence of God. <clears throat> okay, so that is just a quick run through from Genesis through Revelation of some places where songs are mentioned in the Bible. We miss some. Uh, there are many that I glossed over. There are some I missed, like the Hebrews 13. Uh, some of them have more detail. There are places where it's, it's just you know mentioned in, in passing. Um, but I wanted to, to, to make a, a quick look at for the reason of, I, I think it's important to realize that, you know, from the beginning, music in whatever form uh, it, uh, that, that humans created it, you know, music and songs have been a part of our lives. It, it is, you know, part of the, uh, I think it's, it's part of the experience of being alive. I, I don't know how it works, uh, but... You know, if you look at music today, some of its varying quality that you could debate, uh, but people use it, again, to celebrate. Uh, it is, uh, it can be a comfort when you're mourning. It can uh, <clears throat> be something to, to give a message. You know, we frequently sing. And, and what are we doing? We are singing praises to God, you know, just like we've, we've seen several examples of. Uh, so singing is definitely a part of being human and very much a, also a part of our relationship with God. Uh, so we're going to come back to a bunch of these things that we've, uh, we've gone over. What did I do with my glasses? It's annoying when you get old and can't read without them. So <clears throat> that's the first part of today's lesson. Um, as, as I've been thinking about this, I've had a song in my head, so I figured this would be a good song to start off with and, and, and look a little closer at you know, what, went into, what went into it and, and the writing of it. <clears throat> Just for the record, I do have this book, Then Sings My Soul, uh, 150 of the World's Greatest Hymn Stories. Uh, mostly traditional hymns in here, and for each one there is a, a page with the song and then a page with a bit of a story. Um, you know, some of it is just, a, you know, like a, 
uh, more of an author profile, you know, some of it uh, where, where there's, you know, some sort of record, maybe the author said, you know, this is, this is what inspired me or this is what happened in, in my life. So you, you can find some stories like that. Uh, some of them, some of the, uh, some hymns have really famous backstories, some don't. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I may pull some things over the next few weeks from that. Um, it, it, it's, it, it certainly doesn't live up to my subtitled topic that we had earlier about the his, historical connections. It's a very own, only loosely tied. <coughs> Excuse me. But the song I, that's been in my head ever since I've started uh, preparing these is when we all get to heaven. And that's because that first line, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. So just a little bit of background. It was written by Eliza E. Hewitt. Uh, she apparently wrote several hymns. Uh, she was, it's been some years ago that she was alive. She was writing in the late 1800s, the early 1900s. And uh, what I read did not say exactly when it was that she wrote this song. Uh, she was also the writer of Sunshine in My Soul, More About Jesus. There were a couple of other songs that were mentioned that I was actually not familiar with. Um, and who knows, there may have been more I've, uh, if, if you really got to digging into it. So the song itself, I'm just going to run through the verses, look at how the tie, there's tie into some scripture. <coughs> So the first verse, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. So that's what got it in my head because, you know, I'm thinking, okay, you know, we, we sing and sing the wondrous love of Jesus. But then it, it transitions into something that the title actually is closer to, a vision of heaven. You know, they're singing the, about the love of Jesus and his mercy and his grace, but now we're thinking about seeing Jesus in heaven. So in the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Now this one is very obviously comes from John 14, uh, where Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. And, you know, some years ago, this is, uh, I normally use the New American Standard. Uh, King James would have been common in the 1800s. And in that passage, it, it says, in, in my father's house are many mansions. Uh, so in my father's house are many dwelling places. If, I, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, so, I mean, these two lines from the song are just right out of that verse. Uh, they're, you know, mansions, bright and blessed. And, and, there, and we'll, we'll get into some, you know, the brightness, maybe what we're going to get into in a second in, in some of the other verses. Uh, but he goes to prepare a place for us. Boy, that's... That's just really encouraging, you know. Not not only I mean we, we think about you know heaven one day you know after we're gone uh, there'll be eternal life but think about it he's going to prepare a place for us that that is you know hard hard to comprehend almost. Second verse. When we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Well, my laptop has decided it's not going to do anything. I'll just have to work from that. Um, this one is a little less obvious, uh, but there are uh, some tie-ins to some of that imagery of heaven. Uh, from, from Revelation 21, it says there'll no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Uh, so that has a very similar feel uh, to, you know, you know, this picture that the songs is talking about. Oh, it's cloudy, it's dreary, there's, you know, there's a lack of joy, you know, it, it's sad. But when traveling days are over, there's not a shadow, not a sigh, meaning, you know, all this dreariness is going away. There won't be any mourning or crying, mourning or, crying or pain. Uh, and then in Revelation 22, there will no longer be any night and they will not have any need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. Uh, so here's that. There's not going to be a shadow. 
Uh, and we mentioned earlier about the, the brightness that was described in, that, in the previous verse. Uh, so once again, there's drawing on, on this imagery of heaven and how it is bright and it's joyous. There's, there's no pain, there's no sadness. This one I, I actually couldn't find. Nothing, nothing came to my mind for the third verse. Uh, it, it's certainly a good exhortation. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. Uh, there, there is a, uh, a passage in Thessalonians that talks about when he comes again. Uh, so w when, when I read that one glimpse of him in glory, that, that, that comes to my mind. But it's, it's not a, a direct tie-in, so I didn't put it down. Uh, fourth verse. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. Now we're getting back to a direct pull from Revelation. Um, you know, you, you hear in um, just colloquial use, uh, people will talk about, you know, going to see the pearly gates as, as a euphemism for for leaving this earth and dying. Uh, and honestly, when, when I hear that, uh, I'd forgotten about this picture. We, uh, it's the description of heaven here where it talks about all the jewels and the foundation and this gate and, and that gate. Uh, it's really beautiful and it's intended for, for you know, figurative as it is. Uh, but Revelation 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. It had been huge. You know, a gate was a, was a pearl. So, uh, you know, how, how do you translate that in, in, into something earthly? You can't. Uh, but that, that idea of the pearly gates, you know, that actually comes from Scripture. Uh, so, soon the pearly gates will open and we shall tread the streets of gold. In the same verse, uh, the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Uh, and again... Transparent gold, you know, how is a metal transparent? I don't know. Uh, but it is glorious and it is beautiful and it is some place that we can absolutely go. Uh, so th this one is, uh, you know, this is a song that's, I mean, what did we say? You know, 1800s, 1900s, it's been sung for, for decades and uh, over 100 years. Uh, <coughs> Of 10.04. Okay, so we probably will finish a little early. Do you have any comment? Yes. Please fill up my time because I, I ended up with five more minutes than I planned. said Psalm 84? Yeah, and I'm going to have to go back and, and read the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, as, as a, a pilgrimage, you know, this, this pilgrim pathway, you know, life is not easy. Uh, so, you know, clouds will overspread the sky. Uh, and and go, again, it goes back to that contrast between earth and heaven. You know, earth can be a dreary place. It can be full of pain and suffering and struggle. Uh, but man, when we get there later. How sometimes we overlook because of the time factor of how important worship is to God. And you know, in the in the days we live in now we have worship set down for an hour, hour and a half or whatever like that. But think about when the Israelite children worship God. They sat 
say hymns, they had sacrifices, and in some cases the Bible says they had thousands of sacrifices. So that's part of worship. How long do you think that took? <laughs> Worship is important to God, absolutely. And, and I, I like your, your thought about how long did it take for them to do thousands of sacrifices? I mean, how, how many people did they have? Yeah. Justin. And, and we could debate this, but one of the things I love about, you know, hymns is, um, you know, you can get it like an earworm in your ear. It's got this song in my head. So, like, in the morning, I like to, you know, just do the readings. <laughs> my head sing a song and it kind of sticks in my head you know throughout a good portion of the day so it keeps me thinking about God and, and what the words of the song say and it puts me in a better, better mood all together mm -hmm. versus you know when I don't think about it I'm just thinking about other stuff that's a good point songs stick in your head you know, most of the time when we think about that there's a, you know something annoying that is that we've heard and then we can't get rid of it uh, but man, how much better is it if you have Sing the Wondrous Love of Jesus stuck in your head all day long? Yeah. Go ahead. 